All right, so um, so we're going to begin the class then. Um, in in um, like, oh, there's a chat feature. So if you have something you need to ask me, feel free to either chat, send me a chat question. I'll get plan to get to that somewhere along the course uh, today, each day as much as possible. Um, so that helps out, and especially you can write out. We have found sometimes that when if you are talking, try to talk. Uh, as I'm teaching, sometimes because of the distance and because of the internet and not being as strong, sometimes uh, I cannot hear or others cannot hear. So sometimes writing it out is the easier way, writing out your questions under the chat feature. So feel free to do that. Um, so that's all set up. We're getting ready to go. Um, let me share a little bit about my testimony so you can get to know me better and my background, and then that will maybe help you to understand, uh, understand more about me. I'm not just a, uh, a teacher. Um, I, at my heart, I'm a, uh, first of all, and foremost, I am a believer in Jesus Christ, and I thank God that I have heard the gospel um, as my neighbor lady who lived across the street from me invited me to come to a Bible preaching church. I did not realize what a Bible preaching church was, but uh, but I I enjoyed going there. I knew the people there were uh, loved me and cared for me, and that meant a lot to me. So as a child, at about age five or six, is the first time I remember ever going to church and hearing the gospel. But I was not hearing it at home, so I didn't really understand all that was involved. But I was learning little by little what the gospel was about, and then. <clears throat> I started, I was attending church pretty faithfully, and uh, many of the people at church, including the pastor, thought I was a believer, um, though I had not yet trusted Christ as Savior, and nor followed him in baptism. And then about age 12, I remember very distinctly um, a, a conversation I had with several others. I had family members with me. Uh, my sister and her children were visiting, and at that time, uh, I, I remember being involved in, in uh, doing some doing some childish things, but also some disobedience matters. And my mom made a statement to me. Uh, my mom was then beginning to grow as a, as a Christian. She had, was was a believer when I was born, but she was not living for the Lord when I was born. But at age 12, she started to attend church more. She just said, you know, Christians shouldn't act like that and sent me to my room as a 12-year-old child and so I had to leave my family and, and, and kind of sent to my room for the night. And I remember lying in bed and the Holy Spirit using that statement my mom made to bring conviction to my heart um, about the fact that Christians should not act like that. And then am I really a Christian? By then, at age 12, I'd been at church long enough to know how to become a Christian. Um, but I did not recall a time where I personally asked Christ to forgive me my sins and be my savior, where I trusted his finished work on the cross of Calvary um, to save me from my sins. And so there in my bed, actually I got down in my, in my bedroom there beside my bed on my, on my knees, actually, I begged the Lord to forgive me my sins and be my savior. Before I even did that though, I remember this very distinctly. I thought to myself, what will all the people at church think? Because they all think I'm a Christian. And uh, we all know what that problem is. The big problem that I'm actually preaching a series at in my church on right now on pride. And so at age 12, I was struggling with pride and thinking, what would others think of me when they all think I'm a Christian? But the Lord still convicted my heart, and I'm so glad he did not give up on me. And so I asked the Lord to forgive me of that sin as well and to save me from my sins. And at age 12, I trusted Christ. I remember going to tell my mother and my mother said, oh, you already, got, you already became a Christian years ago. I said, no, I didn't. I mean, I knew the, I knew the facts. I knew the truths of Scripture, but I, was not, I did not ever trust Jesus as my Savior. And so that, in a sense, that was my first sense as a 12-year-old of persecution where I was where I actually shared with my own mother that I was a Christian and she said no you you already became a Christian no you're not you, you're getting confused and I said no I'm not confused I now I fully understand I called upon Christ to be my savior about a year later after that after more discipleship and growing and attending church more faithfully uh, I followed the Lord in baptism I went through a process as any Christian should do where he I was becoming uh, a new creature 
the Lord changed me from the inside out, regeneration. And and what was inside me, the Holy Spirit that was living inside me was doing its his work and working out uh, and changing me, changing my attitudes, changing my speech, uh, changing my music, uh, changing my motives, my intentions, all was involved that. He was doing a great work in my life. At the same time, I had a great hunger for the Word of God and began to to study it and, and learn it. Um, and I'm so, so thankful for that. I gave up the old music of my past, which was worldly music and rock music. And I did not know about any other kind of music other than uh, you know, rock music, country uh, music, um, um, classical music, and, and, and what, I, what I call church music or hymns. And so as a so I got rid of all my worldly music and I began to I began to learn the hymns of the faith. And I learned I memorized and learned a lot of the hymns of the faith because that's the only music I knew that I that was pleasing to God. Um, so I began to learn the hymns and began to grow in Christ, studying God's word and loving God's word. And, and the Lord really put the change in my heart. The Lord allowed me uh to, here in America, we have a lot of Christian schools. I know you have Christian schools there as well. And the Lord allowed me to go to my last three years of high school in a Christian school. And that was a new experience for me. I did not even know what a Christian school was uh, a couple of years before that. But I started going to a Christian school. And that is where I met my wife um, and my uh, my bride, my wife of 38 years. And Dr. Victor was able to meet her the first time this past spring as she came to India with me and that was a wonderful time and helped her really to be able to love and pray for India better and so Sherry came with me there um, we met her there in high school we went off to Bible college together and the Lord had not yet called me to preach and so I'd be uh, but I wanted to serve the Lord so I began to study uh, two of my favorite subjects in, in the world they still are math and science and so I uh, majored in math, minored in science, and began those studies and going on that path, uh, planning to be a teacher. And uh, about halfway through my sophomore year, um, though I was enjoying my math and science, God had been working on my heart, and so I surrendered to preach. I believe the Lord had called me to preach, and so I surrendered to be a preacher of God's word. And I uh, began to train and, and change my major in Bible college to study God's word. And as time went on, my love for God and for his word and for the ministry continued. And I was able to stay on for my seminary work and get my Master of Divinity degree uh, while at the same time serving in a local church for nearly three years while I was in seminary. It was a great practical experience. By the way, you may want to mic your you might want to meet your mics. Um, because sometimes people will come in. It's just mute your mics if you have not done so already. Um, and if, if there's opportunities to talk, then we'll do that later. We're just, up to this point, just mute your mics, and that helps everything. It helps the recording, and everything go smoother. But so I, so I answered the call to preach. I began to prepare for ministry, and the Lord allowed us um, allowed me to go into the pastoral ministry, which I've been now in the pastoral ministry for. Um, well, it's been over 30 years now, uh, just entered my 30th year of being in pastoral ministry. In the same, at the same time, I've also been involved in missions work, really international missions work, really since the early 2000s, but especially in Asia since 2006. I've been involved in different countries of, um, of Asia and mostly in China and the Philippines. And then in the past five years, uh, much more in India also. And so just being able to pour my heart, uh, my pastoral heart, my um, love for ministry, my love for my Savior into pastors and preachers and evangelists there in Asia has been my burden. And, and as uh, Dr. Victor said, I now in the, have the privilege not only of pastoring a church, which I still do every Sunday, but I also am the executive director of Vision 2020 Asia, which come which desires to come alongside Asian pastors and preachers and, and equip you and help you and encourage you um, to take the baton and to carry on and train the next generation yourself. 
And so that that kind of is a little bit of my background. Um, along the way, I also, while I was a pastor, did earn my doctor of ministry degree. Uh, my dissertation is on the local church, and uh, it's uh, and there's a book actually. Do I have one here? My study. Oh, I'm teaching for my study here. It's, I have my study in my home, um, but this is this is my uh, dissertation that has been now made into a book form. That's the English version of it. It's also, thank the Lord, been translated into Hindi, and then this past spring was translated into Nepali, into the Nepali language as well. And those are available through. You can get this through Doctor Victor, or he can direct you to the right person if you'd like to have a, a copy in Hindi or Nepali or English. Um, they're they're all available, and Dr. Victor is a resource for you there. Um, but and that's that was uh, my heart burden in the local church. I'm still a local church pastor, and I'm still very much involved in the church because Jesus said that He will build His church, and He put such an emphasis in Matthew 16 upon His church. Uh, I want to be a part of that, and I want to not only pastor it, I want to help to build His church also as one of His laborers. And so that's kind of where my heart burden is. Now, let's talk about this course. This is a course I entitled Biblical Foundations. Uh, I think, uh, and I've, I've named it very, very um, purposely, Biblical Foundations. It's a study of Genesis 1 through 11. It's not an overview. It's actually really a verse-by-verse -verse study that we're going to go through Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, it is going to be very Bible oriented. We're not going to talk about all the leading theories that are out there. We're not going to we'll address them. Um, we're not going to talk about evolution. Uh, we're going to talk about what the Bible says and, and, and that aspect. So we're not going to study all those other matters. I've studied those, and probably you have too. In uh, your uh, if you came up in a public education, you probably have learned a lot about evolution also. Um, and it's and I'm using the word foundation because I believe your understanding, your understanding, of study of Genesis one through eleven is foundational for the rest of Scripture. And if you do not understand Genesis one through eleven, you'll have a hard time understanding the rest of the Scripture. I believe, and so that's why we call it biblical foundations. And so, uh, for the next uh, thirteen weeks, that's how long the class is. Uh, we will be going through this uh, this course. Um, basically verse by verse through Genesis 1 through 11. Uh, some, some chapters will cover faster than others. We'll spend a little more time in Genesis 1 and 2 because there's so much there to unpack. Uh, but we'll be going the next 13 weeks. It won't be every week because I do have uh, several trips planned into other parts of the world. And one of those trips, I'll be two, like for instance, two weeks from today, I'll be away. Um, and then again in September, Lord willing, I'll be back in India and so forth, but um, it's going to be basically every Wednesday. I'll let you know if I'm not going to be here. Um, I will give you an assignment. There's a couple of papers we'll be writing for this class, uh, papers that can be made into sermons or foundational aspects for sermons. Uh, also, there'll be a final exam at the end of this class on the last the last day of the class. Um, but anyway, that's that's kind of where we're headed with this and what we call biblical foundations. Genesis 1 through 11. So let's begin. Uh, we've already prayed before the recording started. Let's go ahead and pray again. Just ask the Lord to bless this time, and then we'll get into our study. So Lord, bless our time. Illuminate our eyes by your Spirit, who has given us your word. Lord, help us to be a practical and, and just a trans transformational course for, for many of our men here, uh, as far as their pastoral ministry or their their um, evangelistic ministries or their teaching ministries at the Bible colleges or seminaries where they may be teaching. This, may this really transform their lives as they focus more upon your word and what your word has to say. And Lord, help us to not compromise with this world system in which we live. Help us, Lord, not to buy into that world system. But help us, Lord, just to go into your word and see what it says and grow thereby. Help us to be hearers and doers of your word. And use me as your messenger. Give me strength and wisdom as I teach your precious word. I just want to be a channel that you can use to be a blessing and a strengthening to these men's ministries. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, let's try to move on then. I got to remember how Zoom does this. I'm sorry. Okay, so there we go. So let's talk about some basics um, of even how I'll be teaching this class. Just so we're on a clear understanding of this. Okay, so, so some basics of how I'm teaching this class. Um, here's my approach. And, and you, you're welcome to jot these things down. We'll spend, we'll spend a little bit of time on each of these slides. But my approach first is that we're going to be looking at um, approaching the, the scripture, Genesis 1 through 11, with a, from the literal, plain sense meaning. Um, we're not going to be work, worried about some type of hidden meaning that, that God's trying to teach us in Genesis 1 through 11. We're just going to go and read the scripture as God's given to it to us and, and what we call literature. And literature is meant to be read uh, uh, plainly. You know, what does it say? And obviously there's, there's rooms in scripture, there's room in our life for symbolism and allegory, uh, but normally in the in language, and of course we're dealing with the English language here, uh, but you, normally in language, you, you can tell normally when something is symbolic and when, or you know, changed in that way and what's trying to be taught there. But most of language, whether it's written or spoken, is to be taken literally, plain sense. And that's how we're approaching what the, what the scripture says. Um, we're also going to take it within the historical context. Going back and realizing that this was not written last year or 100 years ago or even 1,000 years ago, but was, but was written to us by the pen of Moses. Um and it's a historical context, and so some of it within Moses' time period and Moses' um, language and vocabulary was being used, um, but his, the historical context, uh, along with that, we're talking about the grammatical context of it, uh, Genesis 1 through 11 was given to us uh, in the Hebrew language, and um, many of you I know have, like I have studied uh, Hebrew some, uh, none of us, except maybe Dr. Victor, are Hebrew scholars, um, but we're but it's given to us in the Hebrew language. So we bring we bring out some nuances of the Hebrew um, le uh, letters uh, or language words vocabulary, as well as some of the um, some of the grammar that's involved there. But it was given to us in the Hebrew language, and sometimes it's the the equivalence into an English word can be very hard, very difficult. Um, it is, we are not approaching this study of Genesis 1 through 11 from an allegorical perspective. We're not going to be reading about Adam and Eve and trying to figure out what hidden meaning God's trying to teach about Adam and Eve and, uh, you know, and, and what the, these, what Adam uh, represents and, you know, what Eve represents, uh, you know, when we start doing that and going beyond what the scripture says, it gets very dangerous because it relies more upon our logic and upon our reasoning. And oftentimes that's influenced by our backgrounds and our own uh, presuppositions. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to approach it from a, uh, from a literal, plain sense interpretation. What does it say? What does the scripture say? And uh, we're not going to go and try to figure out any kind of symbolism behind uh, Lucifer and the and the serpent. We're going to take it as literal happening as well. And just on and on we go. Um, now, obviously, and I meant to say this earlier when we talking about literal. Obviously, there's times in language in which things are obviously symbolic. I, let me give you, obviously, some answers in the New Testament. Jesus often used symbolism to try to explain things you know, he, he called himself um the bread of life uh, but when he called himself the bread of life no one mistaken ever mistaken jesus for a loaf of bread you know, he was trying to explain to him that he's a source of food and nourishment you know he called himself the true vine and this is john 15 of course you know, Jesus did not begin to grow leaves and branches you know he was he was using the fact that he was a source of life for the branches to bear the fruit. And, you know, so we know when the symbolism is there. But when we, and there, there may be a couple of times where we see some symbolism involved in Genesis 1 through 11, but we're approaching it from a literal, plain sense meaning. 
We're going to just read it for what it says. We're not going to try to figure out some kind of hidden um, message there, uh, what the allegory might be, because that becomes dangerous because it relies more upon us and our our presuppositions and, and so forth. I mean, there is a movement out there, uh, even within the evangelicalism, that says Genesis 1 through 11 is all allegory. You know, it's all allegory. It should not be taken literally Genesis 1 through 11. This is, uh, this is, this is, um, this group is shrinking, I think, among evangelicals, but it's been out there for probably 100 years. And, and, um, the dangerous part of that is if Genesis 1 through 11 is, allegorical and mythological and symbolic then then when does how do we know that jesus you know Genesis 12 through 50 is not also symbolic and allegorical and and then maybe exodus and leviticus and numbers and deuteronomy and you know so when you when we start arbitrarily saying we don't really understand Genesis 1 through 11 so obviously it's allegorical or we don't really we don't we look at Genesis 1 through 11 and it contradicts um Darwin's theory of evolution, you know, uh, it contradicts other arguments that scientists scientists are making. Um, when we start going down that route, then where do we stop? And the answer is we, we before long, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all allegorical and symbolic, and we can make it say and mean whatever we wanted to say. That's very dangerous. And so that's what I'm warning you against and saying we're not going to approach this, this study this way. I'm going to take the scripture very literally. Uh, God told us plainly what he wanted us to understand. And also we're working from the basis that's throughout scripture. There's no contradic contradictions in scripture. And we're going to try to learn and understand the meaning of the scriptures, Genesis 1 through 11, as we look at other parts of scripture. And I just remind you of what it says there in Second Peter chapter three, um, where even Peter himself made this mention. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, Second Peter chapter three, which I, I love the the honesty of Peter when he says in Second Peter three, beginning verse fifteen, uh, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Also, according to wisdom given to him, uh, that was given to him, hath written to you. So he's talking about well, this theological truth, God's long suffering and caring for the lost souls. And he wants people to be delivered and saved. And he says, and by the way, I'm not the only one saying this, Peter says. Um, Paul also teaches this in his epistles. And then he goes in verse 16, the apostle Peter does. And by the inspiration of God's spirit makes this comment. I'm so glad he did. Uh, as also in all his Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And so Peter, first of all, says, you know, even as an apostle of Christ, Peter says, uh, I, I read some of Paul's writings, and it, it, they're hard to understand. I don't understand them all. So I'm glad Peter was so honest like that. But he says that, but there are some, there are some brothers in there who also do not understand. They're twisting these things to make them say what they want them to say. And that's very dangerous. And, and a lot of people do this with Genesis 1 through 11. They twist the scripture to say what they wanted to say. A twist to Genesis 1 through 11 to fit into evolutionary uh, theory. They twist Genesis 1 through 11 to fit into um, other uncle, but maybe scientifically friendly um, statements or theories. And they are trying to meld together the, the scripture with, uh, with science or I'm going to call it scientific theory. Um, and we don't have to do that. We don't have to twist the scriptures and wrestle the scriptures. And this is what Peter is trying to say about Paul. So there's going to be some things that go back to Genesis 1 through 11. There will be some things we're going to Genesis 1 through 11. And I'll just say to you as your teacher, you know, I'm just not 100% sure what this means or what this is trying to communicate 
but but I believe it. I, I don't understand it fully. And maybe the Lord will give us understanding in the future, but that's that's where we're coming from. And that's where Peter was coming from. And then the second approach I want to bring out is the idea of theology, a uh, second basic, I, I mean, I should say, is this is a theology study, obviously, um, as any study of Scripture should be. But whereas many times we study on our, this level a systematic theology, um, which is the idea of bringing different parts of Scripture, Genesis and Exodus, and then maybe in First Samuel and then in, in Proverbs and Psalms, and then maybe then the, the Gospels, and and uh, throughout even even all the way into Revelation, and we're making a, a systematic understanding of this. We're piecing these things together, maybe through a progressive, um, a progressive revelation going on there, maybe just different parts and pieces put together there. We do a systematic study of that. For instance, maybe I'll give you one um, regarding marriage, uh, which I believe is clearly uh, established for us in, in the sixth day of creation. Uh, but just so much is said there. Uh, so little is said there. It just basically says, man shall leave his father and mother, and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And that's basically the theological teaching in on the sixth day of creation uh other than that god brought eve to adam other than that you know that's very foundational very important we'll begin to that but that's just the beginning and but yet throughout scripture that's built upon so well to help us understand throughout scripture what a marriage and a family should look like that's a systematic study uh, in our study in Genesis 1 through 11, though we will look at other parts of Scripture, we're really going to focus most of our time on just what the text says in Genesis 1 through 11. And we'll eventually, as I mentioned, go from time to time to other parts of the Bible to be able to understand uh, maybe better what's being said here or communicated or illustrated here. Uh, but it's going to be a biblical, it's, it's what we call in the in the doctrines, or I'm mean, calling the disciplines. Um, biblical theology um so as we strongly biblical theology uh, very little systematic theology okay going on to a few more basics here as we look at the scriptures and uh, these matters um we we learn and i believe that the author and compiler of these eyewitness accounts are is moses himself and he is the author. Um, we know that from, let's just say, just, uh, Matthew chapter 19, among other places. This is There's several places in the scripture where this is made clear. But Jesus himself uh, told us, Matthew 19. When the, when the, the uh, religious leaders were challenging Jesus on the topic of marriage and on the area of divorce, but in, on marriage especially, and Jesus uh, quotes that verse I just quoted from Genesis 2, 24, and then Jesus says in Matthew 19, verse 7, and they say to him, first the religious leaders, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put away, put her away? And that's an allusion there to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And, and Jesus says, verse 8, Moses, because the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, but from the beginning, that's when Christ is identifying when day six institution of marriage took place it's in the beginning it did not evolve after billions of years but in the beginning it was not so and i say to you whoever shall put away his wife except to be for fornication shall marry another commit adultery and whosoever marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery and so this is in the ask this is in that context um of jesus using genesis 2 uh to to prove his point about what marriage is about, but he's also pointing back that Moses was the one, the writer of the Pentateuch here, uh, was Moses who gave us these accounts and recorded these accounts for us. So Jesus identifying Moses then as the author 
But I won't use the word compiler, uh, especially here at Genesis, because as we, as we read through Genesis, one, especially 1 through 11, and this is the second point here, I gave you a couple different places here where you can see um, a couple different verses we're going to look at. Where we're going to see that Moses was not as much writing down directly from the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit obviously was involved in this, but was really compiling other written records that were given to us um, and recorded for us. Some of them could have been oral tradition, but I think really what's implied is a written record. So let's look at Genesis 2. We're getting a little now into our text, into our into our study. And by the way, I plan to take breaks usually about... Uh, for you, it'd be usually about 20 minutes after the hour is what I aim for. And then give us a 10 minute break and then we'll start again at the bottom of the hour for the next the next quarter, uh, the second part of each day. Um, so in about 10 minutes or so, we'll take a little break. But in Genesis 2, verse 4 it says this, using this phraseology, you'll see us again and again. Genesis 2, verse 4, after we have the six days of creation being recorded in a very just factual way, um, a very point by point, day by day record here that says in verse four of chapter two, these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So just that formula, and there's that formula. These are the generations, the heavens and the earth. Like, okay, this is this is what happened. This is the record that was passed down. Maybe that was passing orally, uh, but I think it's implied written-wise. But then in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And using the word book there, that definitely implies uh, a written record. And I know evolutionary evolutionists say, well, you know, my, uh, prehistoric men could not write. You know, well, they're, they're working. They're working from a whole presupposition of evolution. Um, Adam was one that was, especially before he sinned, was the part of the smartest human that ever lived before sin entered into his life. And so Adam was able to write and make records, and we have his book recorded for us, especially the first four chapters. Uh, seems to be the record that, that Moses was referring to. Um, and then, of course, chapter 5 is kind of the genealogy that follows that. In chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 9, here's that formula again. These are the generations of Noah. And so, like a record Noah made and, and recorded for us and, and of his family and the division of his children and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren we have here. And then chapter 10, verse 1. Uh, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, the, and, and to them were sons born after the flood. So these were records recorded for us as well. Now, God's Spirit led Moses in compiling these things together, but what seems to be implied, and by the way, this didn't stop here, but in our study, which is 1 through 11, this is the last time it says that, Um but is that there is an ongoing co compilation of written records by different patriarchs, um, by God himself, who gave Moses the eye, eyewitness account of what happened, by Adam, by Noah, and by Noah's own sons. Uh, we have these records here, and, and Moses, following the direction and inspiration of God's Spirit, compiled these records together because Moses was not alive during the book of Genesis. We don't even see Moses being born, as we know, until Exodus chapter 1. So how does he know? Because God re recorded a record and by his spirit led him to these records, which he then put into the book we call Genesis, meaning, of course, beginnings. And then we understand the New Testament study uh, proclamation, if you would, a declaration in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll look at that. So this is still uh, those basics we're working with here. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16 and 17, which reads this, all scripture, 
And that would, of course, record, it would include Genesis and through Revelation. But all scripture is given, has been breathed out, given by inspiration. And I, inspiration is I have been breathed out. So all scripture has been breathed out, has been given by inspiration. And here's the most important part, by God or of God. He's the, uh, he's the ultimate author of all scripture. This account we have in Genesis, um, though Moses was the human writer, and though all these books have human writers, they're still given to us by God. This is the record he wants us to have. So we cannot go back, we should not go back, like some evangelicals have, and say, well, this is what Moses understood in his traditions. So what Moses understood in his in his time period and his his innocency and that's why moses wrote no the jesus 1 1 all the way to the end of revelation has been given to us by god himself uh inspired by him given to him and by the way it goes on and what he has given to us in the scripture from Genesis to revelation is profitable for us it's profitable it is. It benefits us. It helps us understand God better, but also under, helps us understand us better. Helps us understand the institutions better, especially in Genesis, where we have the institution of marriage going on there, where we have the institution of government going on there. And at the very end of our study, probably the thirteenth week, we'll see actually the institution of the nation of Israel. And these things are brought out to us here in Genesis one through eleven. It's profitable for us in, in these areas for doctrine. It teaches us uh, you know, what's right. It teaches us the, the, the correct things. It teaches us the correct perspective. It teaches us the correct facts. It's not based on what people thought. You know, it's based on what, what God wants us to know. Um, so it's teaching, it's doctrine. It also is profitable for reproof. It tells us when we do what's wrong. And we'll even see some examples of that in Genesis 1 through 11, where good men uh, made bad decisions. The first one being Gen um, Adam, who is perfect, and Eve, who disobeyed God and ate of the fruit of the tree. Uh, so for reproof, it, it shows us how disobeying God is wrong. And, and um, then it also is, is profitable for correction. It'll show us how to make things right when we do what's wrong, because we all will do what's wrong. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then it gives us instruction for righteousness and trains us to make wise decisions and gives us good warnings as to not listening to the temptations of the evil one, um, not following the crowd, um, and so forth, and tells and instructs us in the righteous ways of doing things. It tells us and teaches us, for instance, that if we do what's right, uh, we will be in the minority. That's always been the case, as uh, Noah demonstrates for us. Noah and his family are the only ones of all mankind who survived uh, the, the flood, and that's because of their obedience to God. And verse 17, the word of God is that tool that then makes us perfect and equipped and, and complete and able to do all good works and to serve him. So that's made very clear. Genesis has been inspired of God as part of God's inspired scriptures. Then over in 2 Peter chapter 1, a cross-reference to the 2 Timothy, 2 Peter chapter 1, we have the Additional information given to us wonderfully. In Second Peter chapter one, uh, after this account where Peter, by inspiration of God's Spirit, uh, warns us not to elevate experiences to the same level as the authority of Scripture, because for one thing, for sure, experiences will will uh, mislead us. Our experiences will mislead us as we don't understand them necessarily. Um, but the word of God will always lead us per perfectly. Uh, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning even verse 19, uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, not experiences, um, as great as experiences are and spiritual victories are and spiritual mountaintops are, 
Uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well, as you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. That's not one man's opinion. That's not how they come up with the scripture or a group of people get into a room and decide what they want. No, that's not how it happens. But verse 21 reminds us, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is how we got the scriptures from, from Moses. Moses uh, didn't just get in the back room somewhere or maybe every once in a while uh, or back cave somewhere and every once in a while come, you know, talk to Aaron or talk to Joshua and, and, and then wrote the Pentateuch. That's not what happened. But as it says here in verse 21, these holy men of God, including Moses, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that word in the Greek, moved there, uh, is also used referring to the wind that catches a sail of a ship or a sail of a boat and moves it along the river or moves it along the ocean. And uh, that's how the Holy Spirit uh, catches the wind of a man's soul and a man's mind. Who is, who is writing the scripture by inspiration and directs him um, to the, the even the words that he puts down on the page. And so God inspired and gave us the book of Genesis, uh, the New Testament confirms for us. And, and then and Moses then was used by God to author and compile these things, especially the book of Genesis. Moses was born in Exodus 1, so that... He, he lives through those parts. But Genesis, it was all took place before Moses' birth. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the rest of the children of Israel, patriarchs, they all lived and died before Moses was ever born. So he had to write these things down as he compiled the records and led by the Holy Spirit uh, as to the words and the teachings and the lessons to teach us. Lastly, we're talking about the date. Uh, the date of the writing of Genesis uh, took place long after it happened, but during the lifetime of Moses. And Moses is estimated to have lived around 1,500 to 1,400 years before Christ. Um, and that's also about the lifetime uh, of, of, of um, or actually after the lifetime of even Job and Abraham. Um, of course, Abraham lived there. We will see him at the end of this course, just introducing him at the end of this course as we get to Genesis chapter 11. Um, but Job and Abraham were, were probably living at the contemporaries, probably living at the same time right after the flood. And so this happened long after these men lived and died as well. Um, as God used Moses, chose Moses to record for us this very important book that we call the Book of Beginnings, the Book of Genesis. It's going to take a 10 minute break and we'll come back in 10 minutes um, and start getting a little more into the text itself and uh, some of the background, getting a little more into the scripture itself. So take a 10 minute break and then I'll meet you back here right at, what will that be for you? 530 your time, I believe. Okay, Enjoy your break. <music> 